Hi, good morning. Yeah, it's still good morning because it's not 12 yet. And uh, today is Monday, my non clinical working day. <laughs> I was exhausted yesterday. A lot of uncooperative patients, both on Saturday and Sunday. They do exhaust you a lot, even though the work is simple. It's more of talking and behavior management. So, anyways, that being said, uh, let's solve another. Uh, scenario based question for the Australian dental exam part one is July and it's July 8th, August, and I think middle of September is your exam, right? I don't know the dates. I'm gonna ask, How's the preparation going on? How are you feeling, guys? Nervous, stressed, confident? So it's, it's okay to have mixture of the feelings. Uh, again, like I said repeatedly, as I've been saying since past one year, solve the past papers. They are the key to clearing the exam because the more you solve, the more your analytical skills are going to develop and the more you'll feel confident in reading the question, identifying the keywords fast, fast is the key, speed is the key because for each question you have less than two minutes. And competition is tough and the money involved is huge. It's not a cheap exam. You know that by now. So uh, let's solve one of the questions. And by the way, I'm keeping up to my word and I finished my 30 days of my walking on the treadmill today. It's really hot, so can't go out in the sun. But yeah, uh, I'm keeping my word and doing it as as. A participant in your own journey I asked you all to do 30 minutes of workout daily because it increases oxygen to your brain and brings in some positivity even if you are feeling a little low sad which is very normal to feel I also feel many times sometimes a lot but somehow this kind of boosts me up and it's like okay I can go through my day <laughs> some some days are really tough you know so anyways, having said that, let's let's start with the first question for today. I mean, the only question for today. I just solved one question in one video so that it's easier for you, short videos. A fit and healthy 15-year-old boy presents to your practice after a hockey tackle. Okay, he was playing sports. He's fit, he's healthy, he's 15. That means most probably all the permanent teeth are out in the mouth, which resulted in an injury to his upper right central incisor. All right. The crown of the tooth remains intact, fair enough, but it is tender to percussion. So basically, there is no fracture of enamel or dentine, no at least class 1, class 2 fracture. Bleeding from the sulcus is observed. <laughs> okay, this is a key word. Whenever you see bleeding from the sulcus is observed, it means some damage has happened between the attachment of the tooth to the bone. And how is the tooth attached to the bone, alveolar bone, is through the periodontal ligament. And if the periodontal ligaments have been stretched or severed, then the places where they are attached are also injured, which means the, there has been an injury to the cementum, which holds on to the periodontal ligament on one end. And uh, the place where the periodontal ligaments are inserted in the alveolar bone. And periodontal ligaments are vascular, right? They have blood vessels in that area. So because they were injured, the bleeding happened and that's how it came out through the sulcus. It means the tooth has to be mobile or it will be tender to percussion for sure. There, there is also a blow to the tooth. So apically, if the blood vessels get severed, that means the pulp also gets injured. You understand? So uh, having known this basic mechanism of how injury works and what are structures that damages and just postulating the consequence of it let's read the question further so bleeding from the sulcus is observed and a sensitivity test yields negative reasons see it's honestly uh, the sensitivity test is it's a useless test when the tooth is in trauma but yes you can do it to have a baseline record for sure uh, but don't believe in whatever result you obtain because when the tooth is in shock, it will not respond appropriately. It will. It is high possibility of a false positive result. Uh, additionally, the tooth exhibits mobility. See, 
uh, whenever there is bleeding from the sulcus, the tooth will be mobile in some way. It doesn't have to be a grade three mobility, it, it, but it would definitely be some mobility. Even if there was no bleeding from the sulcus, for example, and the tooth is still mobile, uh, then probably there is a fracture in the root. So that's why you do the IOPA first to see where it has fractured. It can be cervical, apical, middle, third, anywhere. And based on that, you would be deciding. The above case means that the injury involved <clears throat> what we were just talking about, you know. Uh, so write it down, take a pen and paper. Uh, the things that you're going to read after this video is Ellie's classification. Learn class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The 9 one being a deciduous teeth and uh, again all the deciduous injuries in the teeth according to LSS class 9 but there is a separate classification for the deciduous tooth injuries separately having enamel pulp dentin etc etc that is called as a Garcia Godoy classification okay. The above case mentioned uh, means that the injury involved so we see that the tooth is intact but there is bleeding from the sulcus and it's tend and it's mobile. And what was the percussion mentioned? Yeah, it's tended to percussion as well. So uh, definitely cementum is involved and dentine pulp and periodontal ligament. Okay. Even if dentine wasn't mentioned and the question would have just mentioned cementum, pulp, and periodontal ligament, I would still go with it. The other options are not mentioning periodontal ligament and since this option mentions along with cementum and pulp, it's the right option to choose and hence I'll be choosing that. Why pulp? I again explained the apex of the tooth, if that, that also goes into shock, uh, the pulp will be damaged. So some problem with the pulp has also happened and because the question also mentioned no response to sensitivity test and sensibility test is done on the pulp and if you feel there is no response, the pulp has been severed so again the pulp has been damaged and it has been injured right so yeah and since there is no fracture of the tooth i will not take enamel into consideration because the crown is intact and it shows no fracture after taking one occlusion and two periapical radiographs but not obtaining sufficient information the next course of action would be to consider alternative imaging technique which would be very interesting question see uh, the periapical IOPA gives the best detail. OPG doesn't give that good a detail of the upper anterior teeth. And if you have already taken an occlusion and do periapical and still you can't see anything because sometimes it's very difficult to make out a fracture which is positioned labial and lingual. The mesial distal fractures are very easily seen. The x-ray mostly shows very correct interpretations of mesial and distal things. But the bacolingual, the labiolingual, it's very difficult to see sometimes in the IOPA. So I won't go with the OPG because it won't give me a good detail at all as, as does the periopical. But if I want a very specific detail, then I will go to CBCT and that's why that would be the option of choice. Because you will get the entire section of that tooth in all the three dimensions. After examination, a root fracture was detected at the cervical third of the root. The decision was made to stabilize the displaced fragments and perform a radiographic check using. No, I think the question should be uh, the step, this, what should have been given to stabilize the displaced fragments? I think I have to rewrite this question a bit. But anyways, you got the question. So you, you did your examination, you did whatever x-rays and you saw that there was a cervical fracture and then you decided to stabilize the fragments. Now, how would you do that? I know I've been always a fan of a rigid splint for the root fracture, but uh, that is what we were taught. But of late, the guidelines have changed and they advocate flexible splinting only and for four months. Root fractures always are difficult to heal. It's not... A bone fracture it's a root fracture and root is a strong structure and it would take a lot of time to merge with each other though a true merging with the root will not happen but there will be fibers formed and there will be some form of connective tissue that would be holding the tooth together so flexible splinting for four months is the right answer there is no rigid splint involved anymore be it avulsion be it lateral luxation bone fracture root fracture any fracture 
only flexible splinting. The duration will vary and the longest time is taken only for the root fractures. Alveolar bone fractures like four weeks to six weeks, evulsion two weeks, but uh, root fracture always four months. Four, in fact, it, it can go from six weeks to four months. That's the range. What is your best advice for this player to avoid tooth injury in the future? Mouth guard, definitely. No, but which one? <laughs> I've made a separate video on mouth guards and it's a beautiful video and explaining clearly what is unilaminar, trilaminar, custom stock with pictures. Go through that. Always the best one is a custom made because custom made, it's going to fit exactly onto your tooth and uh, you'll be very comfortable. Boil and bite are easy, cheap, but they are not as tailored fit as a custom made stock is a ready made it's just like you have to bite on it it's very uncomfortable and it's very bulky so the best one would be always a tailored fit thing and that is a custom design one so that's your answer the tooth after a while uh, starts showing discoloration on iop you see the root has a uh, fracture apically okay and now now this is another question now Earlier they said cervically, now they have cerebically, but the fragments are stable after four weeks of splinting. So what would you do? So normally uh, what happens is uh, if the, there's a fracture line in the root and you still feel the fragments are stable, then you try to do the root canal up to the level of the fracture. You don't go deep inside because probably uh, the area where the fracture is from that area, only the pulp blood supply has been severed. Probably at the apex where the blood supply is still coming through, uh, that area is vital. But you don't, you can't, it's very difficult to go through and through to that area. And there is no need also. If that area is vital, let it be. It's not infected, you know. So what you can do is uh, you can just do the root canal up to the level of the fracture line. And uh, that is the option B. If the tooth was very, very wobbly and you after, even after the splinting for four months, it's not getting stabilized, then you may choose to extract it. So, yeah, that is it. So, what you should learn from here is trauma, classification, what would you do in Ellie's class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, the treatment options and read the question and see the question. Now, a same question can be asked to you saying the 15-year-old came and uh, the tooth is not mobile, but there is a fracture in enamel dentine and a pinpoint exposure of the pulp. What would you do? And the options given can be indirect pulp capping, direct pulp capping, cervix pulpotomy, complete pulpotomy, complete pulpectomy. So... You see, all, all the scenarios can be same and yet they can just change a sentence or a line and then your entire options and the treatment plan only will change. So, uh, read all about this. Uh, they can ask on evolution. Definitely trauma questions are going to come because trauma is a daily part of any dental clinician. Uh, as a pediatric dentist, I get at least six to seven trauma cases in a month. And especially when there are holidays, there are more of evulsion cases because they go out, they play, they don't wear mouth guards. Especially in the age group of uh, older children, 8 to 10 years and younger children, always between 2 to 4. Some form of fracture they'll come with, you know. And depending on what it is, I have to cater to the treatment. It can be intrusion, full extrusion, palatal displacement. Or it even goes to a cross bite, a digital replacement, something I have to do. And I have to ask the complete history, how it happened, when it happened. And then explain all the consequences. Some of them turn gray or blackish after three or four months. Some of them come with a lip swelling. Some of them, nothing happens, you know. So you have to have knowledge about the trauma. And trauma is such a thing that will not just come in your OPD like a cavity. And not all traumas you'll be able to see in your own clinical practice and as an intern, you know. So, because trauma is something unexpected and accidental and you can't just induce one so that you can practice. So, you should learn more theory about it because any of those things which you have never seen in your clinic uh, while, I mean, in your uh, graduation, 
uh, can just pop up one day in your clinical practice and you'll be like, oh, I've never done that before. But yes, you have read about it. You have seen about it. You're confident you'll be able to handle it. So do it, right? So I hope you liked this video. Uh, leave in comments how your preparation is going on. What do you think about it? It's always nice to read your comments. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.